like most high school kids, I participated in most of the sports, football, basketball. But I'd always been the local YMCA rat as well, where we had a swimming pool. It was just a little 13-yard pool, but uh, uh, we had a swimming team there, and uh, that's the sport that I was always doing the best in, not the one I liked the best. But, but at any rate, um, when I was in my final year of high school, I decided that I should give swimming a little better go, and so I didn't play football that year. Played basketball though, and uh, and uh, the following year I went to Western, and that's really when I started swimming a lot better because I had more time and more coaching and more concentration on it. And uh, and back then, as long as you passed each year, you keep swimming. So I swam for four years in physical education and four years in medicine. So. I had a pretty long go at it. In my third year, I was fortunate enough to make the Pan American Games team. And uh, back then they didn't have so many events. They didn't have a 100 butterfly, which was my event, but I swam the 100 butterfly lap on our relay, which we got a silver medal in. So I got a taste of international competition. Woodstock Collegiate Institute is where I went. And uh, when I was in grade 13, Libby McCaskill was in grade 10. And I knew her, her father was my dentist and so on. But at any rate, we got, she, she invited me to the Sadie Hawkins dance. That's the turnabout dance that particular year. And uh, and I went and we had some fun, but um, it was a little off and on for nine years before we eventually got married. Right after my first year at university, I was a lifeguard at Gibbons Park, and Mrs. Kennedy came down um, and she said, we got five kids, but the three younger ones, we wondered if uh, you could give them private lessons, private swimming lessons. With the Kennedy children, they, they quickly became very good swimmers and swam for the London Aquatic Club. And uh, I had, along the way, I'd met Dr. Kennedy and he, he and I talked about orthopedics uh, and, and uh, he encouraged me to go into medical school along with other people. And um, while I was in medical school, he would invite me to the operating room the odd time and so it was, uh, I had the orthopedics a little bit ingrained into me, but I still wasn't sure when I graduated. The week after I graduated from medical school, we got married. When we got married, we went to Ann Arbor, where I was an intern and a first year resident. I um, applied then for a year of general surgery, which is what you had to do. And so I applied for orthopedics and I got an acceptance into orthopedics at Michigan, and uh, I was quite thrilled about that, so I came back to tell Dr. Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy said, don't take it. And I said, what do you mean, don't take it? I, I, thought, I thought you thought that was a good place to go. And he said, well, we're gonna start a program back here, and if you know what's good for you, you'll come back and be the first resident in the program. So I went back to tell Libby, who was teaching at Ann Arbor High at that time, which was a pretty good school, and uh, she wasn't so happy about coming back, but we knew what was good for us, so we came back, and um, I became the first regular resident in the program. When I started my residency in 1966, Dr. Kennedy started looking after the UWO football team. Um, Dr. Callahan from St. Joseph's, a general surgeon, had done it up to then, but he stopped then. And um, that was, for the most part, me, because um, the games were at McGill and Queens back in those days. Uh, he would go to the games in Toronto, but uh, I got sent to the others. And through the week stuff, uh, I would meet the people in the emergency room at Victoria Hospital. Back then there was no sub-specialization. You were just an North Peak surgeon and you did what came along. 
although he was interested in knee problems and so quite a few athletes would be steered his way. So I finished the residency in 1969 and because I was the first one, he thought I needed a year of finishing school before I was ready for practice. They call that a fellowship now. But um, he gave me a couple of choices and I selected Duke. Dr. Goldner, the chief, wasn't happy with the, with the knee fellow there because he uh, couldn't use the arthroscope. He said, I tried it, but I couldn't do it. I, I got fed up with it. He said, well, get Bob Jackson down and, and give you another lesson. So Bob came down and I was there then, so I got introduced to it there. I started practice the next year in 19, mid-1970 and um, Dr. Kennedy uh, suggested I go down and with Bob and learn a little bit. So I, I, in 71, I spent two afternoons down there. That was my training. We did three cases each time. It was just, just uh, diagnostic arthroscopy, that's what you did. The Watanabe arthroscope was a bit of an unwieldy thing with an electric light bulb on the end. It was before they used fiber optics. And uh, at any rate, I decided um, that, we sh that it was time. So I think it was in early 1972 that we did our first scope in London. And then the word spread, so I was, I was sort of uh, the technician. People were sending me uh, the scopes to arthroscope, or the knees to arthroscope, and I'd send them back and tell them what they had to do. The odd one would say, you go ahead and do it, but a lot of them didn't, so it was taking a lot of my time. But uh, anyway, we got through that, and uh, after two or three years, uh, fiber optics came out, and we started getting better scopes and we started, uh, we didn't do too much operating with the uh, Watanabe scope except the light bulb uh, was a little tenuous where it came out of the sheath, the, the light carrier. And I had them break off as other people did. So my first arthroscopic surgery was fishing the loose body out using a pituitary ronger. But as the fiber optics came along, uh, we started doing more and more things. We got little shavers to get stuff out of the way, and uh, one thing led to another. We got bolder and bolder till finally we were doing ligaments and everything else. But so I grew up through a big period of uh, of change. And I think Dr. Kennedy was a little bit of a head of the curve on that in that he saw the, the saw that it would be useful to have people to be leaders in the different subspecialties even though you were doing most other things as well. For instance, he sent me just for, for a year at Duke, but. After me, there were people like Rich Hawkins, who we sent to New York for some training with Dr. Near and shoulder surgery, and people in spine surgery, Stu Bailey in spine surgery, and so on. And that was a little bit ahead of the curve, at least in Canada anyway. In 1974, they built Alumni Hall. And the significance of that is there was a, a wrestling room called Combatter's Room in, in Thames Hall wall-to-wall -wall mats where the wrestling team practiced and where we took wrestling classes and so on. But in Alumni Hall, they had a facility for that, so the wrestling team and everybody moved out of that. Dr. Qu Kennedy quickly uh, talked to the president of the university and the uh, head of student health to see if they could turn that into a, a clinic. Uh, to to see the athletes, intramural athletes, intercollegiate athletes, and uh, it happened. So they rearranged it a bit, put some examining rooms in, some physiotherapy equipment in, and um, started having a clinic there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from four to six. Um, Dr. Kennedy did that, and after about two weeks, he said, why don't you take the Fridays? <laughs> So I became the Friday four to six person. It was 1975, I was uh, um, 
one of the orthopedic surgeons on the medical team for the Pan American Games in Mexico City. And then in 80, I was picked as the orthopedic surgeon for the Canadian team going to the Olympics in uh, Moscow. But we didn't go because of because the Russians invaded Afghanistan, of all things. <laughs> and um, so half the world didn't go to those Olympics. And I was always, I never did make it to Russia, and that's one place I'd still like to go. Uh, back in 1983, when I showed up in London, Ontario, uh, I had a fellowship arranged with Jack Kennedy, who at the time was one of the top sports medicine surgeons in the world. I was very happy to be there and it went fine for a couple of weeks. And then uh, one day at football, I got a call in the training room. I answered it and was told that he had passed away. So one of my first jobs was to notify Pete and all the staff that uh, Dr. Kennedy uh, had died. But luckily, Pete didn't send me home back to Michigan. He uh, allowed me to stick around and uh, became my mentor and the Pete Fowler Sports Medicine Fellowship began. Um, Dr. Harvey Bailey took over as chief <clears throat> and he felt it would be better if I moved up to the University Hospital which had been open a few years and it would be easier for me to do the teams and um, and um, and but also start a, an arthroscopy and sports medicine sort of subspecialty so that they got some specific training in it, the residents that is. So that was 1982 and part way through the year a, a chap called Eric Lenzner uh, who had trained in Toronto and was an orthopedic surgeon in Stratford phoned me up to see if he could come down for, for a few weeks or months. He wasn't sure because he wasn't happy with what he was doing. He, he'd like to do the kind of stuff that I was doing. So he came down and I think it was for, I don't know, it was six months or less. And um, he actually got the job during that time at McGill to be the, the head of uh, orthopedic sports medicine there and look after their teams. And um, so I sort of enjoyed having uh, somebody, be, a fellow besides the residents that would be with me all the time. So. And a lot of my American friends, who my associates over there were, had started fellowships. So I thought that was a pretty good idea. Let's get going on it. So we started having them um, from August, starting in August uh, to May, a nine-month fellowship. That's how we started it out. And then it later became a year. One of uh, Pete's great legacies is the fellowship. Uh, he has really trained the leaders uh, of today's orthopedic world um, throughout the world. Uh, there's probably no fellowship that touches um, the corners of the world the way the Fowler Fellowship has. And Pete has uh, trained this generation of leaders uh, to really behave in the way that he has. And that's uh, promote team first, to be humble, to be honest, to be straightforward with their patients. And um, hopefully all of us have taken away some of that because uh, really the fellowship is, is truly Pete's legacy. I'll never forget uh, my first day in the operating room with Pete. He uh, gave me the scope, told me to start the case, and after about two minutes, took the case away and said, take 20 bucks and go to the arcade and learn how to use your hands. I thought it was going to be a long year at that point, but it got a lot better. We renamed it the J.C. Kennedy Athletic Injuries Clinic in 1983. And I thought it was a bit of a shame to be um, vacant all day. So uh, um, in 1984, I was one of the physicians in the Sarajevo Olympics. And Derek Mackesy was um, the, one of the primary care physicians who'd always been interested in sport medicine. And uh, I convinced him to come down and work in the clinic and keep it open all day. And then I'd come over four to six, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And Brian Gastaldi was our head physiotherapist at those Olympics. And I recruited him, but it got too big. 
and unwieldy, and so eventually uh, plans started to build a clinic where we are right now. And that we moved that in, moved in there in 1996. Bob Furlong, who was our manager then, wanted it to be a sort of one-stop shopping thing, and figured that we could have the physio, we could have uh, um, a bracing operation, we could have a little store for things, we could have or orthotics, people come in, and uh, everything except the operating rooms. And so that's what happened pretty quickly, and it ran along very smoothly, actually. It just grew and grew. So we quickly, when, by the time we moved in here, we had four orthopedic surgeons, and we've kept it at that. And uh, now we have four fellows with them, plus the residents. So it's, uh, the orthopedic part is pretty busy, as is all the rest of it. When I hear the name Pete Fowler, a smile comes to my face. He's a unique individual, a good friend, and a trusted mentor. When I arrived in London, Ontario with my wife Nancy and our four small children, we embarked on an adventure. We called Pete and Libby. They immediately said, come on over, we're out back by the pool. So our very first day was spent having a cookout and being amazed by their diving dog and really being impressed by their Canadian hospitality. My experience there was invaluable. He instilled confidence, he challenged me, and to this day I respect his opinion as much or more than anybody else in orthopedic sports medicine. And then I got involved with the Commonwealth Games uh, Association and I was their chief medical officer in uh, 1990 in New, New Zealand and then 98 again in uh, Kuala Lumpur. And those were very, those were fun games as well. Uh, I got involved with the uh, International Arthroscopy Association too. Bob Jackson sort of took me under his wing and made sure I got involved in these uh, societies early on. And then I got involved with the International Knee Society and then these two societies came together and. Um, 1995 was finalized and then the first meeting, combined meeting with them both uh, as one group was in 1997 in Argentina and I was the first president so that was a, a big thrill. And then being president, uh, I was president of CASM, the Canadian Academy of Sport Medicine early on in the 80s and then in 90, uh, 1993, my meeting was, I was president of the American, sorry, 2003, I was president of the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, and um, those were good jobs and uh, decent, decent uh, experiences as well, and I really enjoyed them, and so those were some of the big things. Over the years, Pete has been a huge mentor to me, along with Hawk, and uh, um, on a regular basis in clinic or in the OR, uh, I, I still use his approach to this day. His honesty is forthcoming with patients and uh, his ability to connect with patients and uh, students <coughs> and colleagues around him uh, somewhat unconventionally at times but uh, always uh, direct and uh, sincere and uh, believable anything that he would say. I've tried to teach them just it's the general principles of practicing medicine. Um, listening to the patient. I get very annoyed at people that come to a conclusion quickly before they've listened, ask the right questions and listen to the answers that, uh, that the patients give you because they usually end up telling you what's the matter with them. You have to do the physical exam, but you, most of the time you should know before you do the physical exam. Then, of course, doing a proper physical exam and uh, <coughs> um, trying to be keep your civility when you're talking to the patients. And uh, you no, know, they're not all road scholars, and uh, 
and just be nice. And uh, I think that's the main thing. The surgical skills, I mean, most uh, the surgical skills, they, they, they will learn, they all learn. But the big thing is trying to teach them when to operate and when not to operate. And that's by listening to the patient, I think. This is a sincere thank you for allowing me the privilege of studying under you back in 1991 at Western. I'd also like to really thank you for allowing me and Wendy into your family, for Lib, for Megan, and for little Pete. Um, I'd like to take this time to send a shout out to Ned Amendola, to Tony Miniacci, to Anna Hales, to Betty Rutledge, and to Larry Watson that I did my fellowship with. They say that in karate and in martial arts, the important thing is, the most important thing is stance, and that's having a balanced core. And what I learned from you was to establish my own orthopedic balanced core in stance. It's, it's not me or it's not us, it's the fellows. We've, we've had a pretty good selection. I've been able to select good fellows through the years. <clears throat> and from all over the world. I think that's the big thing. We're not just uh, training Canadians and Americans, although that's the way it started. But um, we have many that come from uh, Australia and New Zealand and um, Europe now, England, but the rest of Europe as well. We've had two or three from Holland. We've had, we've had them from all over the damn place. And uh, I think that, that that's a pretty good indication that we're doing something right anyway. My favorite followerism is, comes to mind at the time we were driving to Devil's Glen in a snowstorm, and I would remember you saying, when the driving is great, the skiing sucks, and if the driving sucks, the skiing is great. And I think that's a good corollary to life. If the training is hard, and rigorous than great patient care and a well-trained surgeon of the result. Mahalo, Pete. Just seeing how some of the fellows really developed in their year here and what they have done subsequently, and many of them have become leaders in, in the field in their respective countries uh, and communities or whatever, and I think that's the biggest thrill.